Hello friend and welcome back to episode number 19 of my 31 day challenge where I am answering your questions every single day about creating a career or a business that you love. And in today's episode, I'm going to be speaking on something that doesn't really necessarily relate to career or business, but it's a question that I get asked so often that I thought I might as well bash one out in uh, in podcast form. And the question is, how do you direct a VR film, aka a 360 video or experience, whatever you want to call it, how do you direct VR? So I'm going to be diving into that. If you've got a question, then please ask it away. Uh, you can ask me on Instagram or Twitter, Alex Makes VR is my handle. You can ask a longer question on email. Uh, you can email me at alexmakesvr at gmail.com. And every single day when I put these episodes live, well, when Anchor does, because it's all nicely pre-scheduled. Um, but when it goes live, I send out a newsletter just to remind you that the episode's live. Um, I also give you a bit of a recap about what I talk about in that episode. So if you want to be reminded, then sign up to the newsletter at alexmakesvr.com. So how do you direct a piece of VR? So for me personally, and disclaimer right at the top that these this is just my personal opinion, uh, opinion, <laughs> opinion, um, and every director that you talk to is probably going to have like different ways of thinking um, about this, and they might have different um, words to kind of communicate because that's one of the the things about VR, right? Is it's so new that um, everything we're doing, we're discovering, including the language that we use to describe the processes behind it. So bear that in mind and just bear in mind that this is just my personal opinion. These are things that I found worked well for me when I direct experiences, but also things that add, as an audience member of VR, I pick up on when someone does this really well. So the three key areas that I would say uh, I use to direct a VR piece are choreography, uh, editing, and sound design. Those three are the big ones. Now, sound design is a little bit of a luxury because you have to be working on a production where you've got enough budget to be working with a spatial audio designer. So I'm I'm not going to focus as much on sound as maybe. Uh, some of you listening might want me to just because I do think that sound is ultimately one of the biggest ways for you to direct attention in VR. Like it's so, so powerful. There was a piece actually this year in Tribeca. Um, oh, I should have looked it up before I started recording. It's a piece where for the first kind of, I think like maybe five-ish minutes of the piece, or maybe it, it felt five minutes, but it was a bit shorter than that. But um you're basically, it's like a one shot where you're like walking after this character in a tunnel, or maybe you're not following a character, but you're following this shadow. And this, this filmmaker, um, well, it was a game, it was a game design piece. So, but we'll call them a filmmaker for argument's sake. Um, they use shadows and a combination of, of, of shadows and sound design to really cleverly reorientate the audience and it was absolutely amazing in terms of directing that piece i must find out should i stop this recording and look it up mm, no but what i will do is i will look it up afterwards and i will um write a, a note in the show notes about what the piece was um so that is like masterful but to some extent, I have to be aware that most people um, who are working maybe on their own projects by themselves or uh, uh, working with um, small budgets might not have the luxury of 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 working with spatial audio. Um, if you can, though, I would highly recommend it because if you think about it, and this is what this is like the number one piece of advice that I would give you as a VR director is. Think about the way that you naturally engage with things in the world. How does someone get your attention? How does something get your attention? Well, sound is such a huge part of it. And when you start to really take note of that, like if you're walking down the street, take note of when your attention is being drawn from, you know, you're looking straight forward. When is it drawn to like look left or look right or look behind you? 
a lot of that is sound. A lot of that is like the positional sound of something that kind of pulls your attention over. But other things might be choreography. So when it comes to directing a piece, if I want someone to look left and I don't necessarily have like a, you know, a sound cue that's going to do that, maybe I will have the subject, whether that be a person or an object or something like that. Maybe I'll have that piece move over to the left hand side of the sphere. If we're thinking about like the frame as a sphere, you know, maybe I'll have them walk off, off uh, center to make you kind of follow them over and discover a new detail that was there. That's one way of really easily doing it. And choreography not only can direct attention as in moving someone's attention from the front to around, you know, whether that be to look left or look right or look behind them. Even just like having that, if it's an actor you're working with, even having them look a certain way you know, like if you're having a conversation with someone and the person you're looking at is is making eye contact with you, but then all of a sudden they kind of like look to the side of you and your instinct is to look at what they're looking at. You want to check what they're looking at. It must be like some kind of hardwired cave person DNA about, um, you know, taking cues about when danger's nearby or something like that, curiosity. Um, and that's what you want from a VR experience. You're trying to incite um, you're trying to instigate curiosity in the audience, but you want you only want them to be curious about the things that you want them to be curious about, if that makes sense. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a VR piece and the direction is just all over the place because the person has this attitude of like, oh, well, if if you've got this 360 degree frame, why wouldn't you just use it all all the time? And it's like, well, as humans, if we were in a situation where there was stuff going on around us, we'd be pretty stressed about that. That is not a comfortable experience. There's a reason why you want to kind of, you know, like when you're at an event and you really hate like standing in the little room, you kind of like you naturally gravitate so that your back is kind of like, is protected like you don't necessarily there's something quite exposing about having stuff going on behind you so and that could be absolutely an intentional artistic choice to then do that to someone but just make sure that if you are going to do that you're doing it intentionally don't make the mistake that a lot of people especially people that are new to vr make which is oh it's 360 i'm just gonna put everything everywhere and have loads going on um because often audience feedback is I didn't like that. I got massive FOMO because I had no idea where I was supposed to be looking. And that is the opposite of good direction. So um, another way you can use choreography, not just actual physical movement of a character or an object to pull attention around, but also just like, where is their eye line? Maybe they make reference or they look to like a, a particular part um, of, the, of the location and that then draws that person's attention. Um, you could, you, if you want to be, if you want to make really kind of sure that someone doesn't miss something, maybe you have like the person call out, like, for example, if you were doing more of like a corporate type um, experience and uh, you wanted them to, maybe it's a, let's say it's an, an, an induction video uh, for new recruits um, and you want, you've got a presenter and you want that person to look left but you don't want your kind of presenter to walk over there maybe you could literally have them say look to your left now and you'll see the fire exit or you'll see xyz whatever it is so you know you could also kind of have that and play with that in your scripting so there's like lots of different ways within choreography that you can do that the second one is the second big one is obviously editing so again this is absolute personal opinion I hate it when people edit within the same scene in a VR piece. Absolutely hate it. Does my nut in because I'm like, you're treating me as if I'm a camera. That cut made no sense. It was jarring. It was quite annoying. And um, now I've been taken out of the piece because there's something about being in a space and allowing your user to kind of like be fully in that space and have the action move around them. Obviously, if you're in like a static 360 piece, if you've got like a more of a room scale piece where they can move around the experience, then definitely have them do that. Like if, if that is what you want to go for. But try not to just cut and have them 
in a different place, in the same room, in the same scene. You know, people try to do the equivalent of like a wide shot and a close up in 360 by just moving the camera. That isn't, that doesn't work in my opinion. Um, and again, I'm very happy to be, to have a discussion with anyone that disagrees with that, but I've, I've shown not only just made VR pieces, but I've shown VR to enough audiences to know generally that audiences do not like that. And it brings them out of the experience and it makes them more likely to say, mm, not really sure why that was a VR piece because it could have very easily been a normal film. Oh, someone's at the door. Shall I just, I'm gonna leave it recording. Hey, yeah. Uh, no, I'm fine, thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Window cleaning. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> where was I? Um, editing, editing. Yes, I'm very happy to have a discussion about it, but audiences generally don't like it. That's where we'll kind of like end on that point. Um, so how can you use editing to like your benefit? Well, you could use, for example, um, uh, you could use, ugh, okay, I'm trying to hang on. Let me bring my thought back to what we're talking about. You know, when you like get interrupted doing something and it takes you kind of like just a couple of seconds to refocus. Okay. That's what I was talking about. Yes. Editing. So there is this principle. And if you've, if you've not heard this theory before, then absolutely Google Jessica Brillhart, B-R-I-L-L-L. H-A-R-T. She was the principal uh, VR filmmaker for Google for a long time. Um, and she wrote this theory about editing in 360. And she basically described the process as jumping between worlds. So if you imagine that in you're in one scene and you're facing a particular way and you know you roughly know where that person's going to be looking because you've intentionally directed their attention there. Um, then when you kind of, when you cut to the next scene, when you edit to that next scene, because I'm not suggesting that all VR pieces should just be like one shots or like done in one location. That's absolutely not like what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that when you do edit, it's the equivalent of jumping worlds. You want to like be in a new space. You want to you know, there's, there's, an, there's a real need and intention to change where you are, not just, you know, to, to move camera position, for example. Um, so Jessica Brilhart talks about this idea of jumping worlds. And what you want to do is you want to line up your points of interest in those two worlds. So if, for example, whilst you're listening to this, you're looking straight forward. Imagine that there's a cup of tea sat in front of you. I mean, for a lot of you, I hope there is because there's nothing more delightful than a, than a podcast and a cup of tea and a biscuit. I hope that you're indulging in a tea and a biscuit on this fine day, um, especially because when you listen to this, it will be Sunday. Will it be? Yes, it will be. So you're going to be in anyway, right. So cup of tea and biscuit straight in front of you. Okay. Now I am going to cut scene and I want you to be in a diner with a pizza in front of you. Now I know, roughly speaking, because I haven't put any other action that's going on in, that, in this scene that I've just theoretically created, I know that there's a good chance that you're going to be looking forward at that cup of tea and biscuit because that's the point of interest. So when I cut to the diner, I'm gonna have the pizza in the same place that the cup of tea and the biscuit were. Because then I've got a really good shot of lining that shot up. And that's the equivalent of like a, a like a match cut because I'm gonna 90% guess that that's where you're looking. And that's where like I want your attention to be. Now, if we gave the, let's, let's give another example. Let's say same scenarios, but this time I want you to be paying attention to your best friend who is in the first scene with the cup of tea and the biscuit. So the cup of tea and the biscuit is straight in front of you. But to the side of you, your best mate is sitting there on their phone and they're chatting to you about Alex Rule's amazing podcast. <laughs> and uh, they, they're looking up at you and they're like, 
hey, you know, you're paying attention to me. And I can guess, theoretically, that you're either going to be looking at the cup of tea or you're going to be looking at your friend that's just asked you if you're paying attention to them. So there's a high probability that you're looking at them. So let's say that they're to the left. So so there's a probability you're looking at them. So when I cut to the next scene, so you answer, yeah, I'm paying attention. Cut, bam. Maybe I have the waitress or the waiter or the... Um, manager of the restaurant that you're at, the diner, uh, in this example, I'm not sure why it's a diner. Um, I'm going to line them up exactly where your friend, your best friend just was. And so when I've jumped to that next world, when I've edited to, to kind of, to move the story on, I'm still guessing that I've managed to line up your attention. And then maybe because I'm guessing that most of you will have been looking at the best friend. So when we cut to that next scene and you're now looking at the manager of the restaurant uh, or the waitress or the waiter, um, now I'm going to have that person walk walk, uh, what would it be? It would be their left, but your right. So now I'm going to have them walk away once they've asked you, um, you know, if everything's all right with your meal, I'm going to have them walk off towards your right. So that then if you weren't looking at the pizza, now you've just discovered the pizza because you've probably followed them as they've walked off. And that has allowed you to discover the fact that you're now in a diner with a pizza in front of you. So that's obviously a, a, a terrible example off the top of my head. But do, um, I'm hoping that whilst you're listening to this podcast, you you can almost like imagine that playing out as I've described it in a very clumsy way. Um, so that's like a really good example to think about. Now, another thing to think about, and this kind of applies to, to, to kind of um, both, I guess, choreography and editing, is this idea that because obviously we are trying to, in VR, you're kind of trying to do that blend of film and theatre and game. And I like to add like a little splash of dreaming, you know, when you dream and it feels real and it feels like you're in control, but then you wake up and it wasn't. And, and it's kind of like most dreams are first person point of view. So take note like from all of these things like when you're watching tv when you're like watching pieces of theater although not right now obviously during covid but um when you're when you're dreaming when you wake up like think about what that kind of looked like what those kind of what that that framing almost was and the way i like to think about doing the equivalent of like a close up or a wide shot or anything like that in vr um I like to think of that. Now, obviously, this is to this totally applies purely to 360, because if you're doing a VR piece that is room scale or uh, the user has a little bit more freedom to walk around, then obviously they can dictate their own um, distance to things. But I would say that personal space and the the space that you give between characters or objects in a frame are the equivalent of things like a medium shot or a close-up or anything like that. So, for example, let's go back to our scene where we are looking at our cup of tea or our best friend who is sat to the left of us. Now, if we want that scene to have the feel of like a wide shot and we want it to feel a little bit more kind of like, you know, we kind of can see everything in the frame. It's like an establishing kind of shot. Um, maybe we have the cup of tea and the best friend like far enough away that you're kind of like you're slightly kind of like seeing them or maybe you have like the cup of tea close to you but you have your best friend like not so much you know directly to the left but you have them kind of like within kind of you can kind of see them within the same frame as the and when I say frame I mean you know if you think about when you're looking at something it's usually like a 90 degree field of view so you have them kind of in the same kind of shot but maybe the best friend is like sat back a bit so it's like it doesn't feel very intimate it's just casual it's like a setup shot it's like you're just kind of getting an establishing idea of like where you are who you are who this person is why you've got a cup of tea and a biscuit um which you never need a reason to have a cup of tea and a biscuit I'm clearly gonna be 
having a cup of tea and a biscuit after I finish recording this episode. Uh, how many times can you say a cup of tea and a biscuit? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, but now let's say that we want to totally change the tone of that scene and we want it to be like your best friends come over to have like a really serious chat with you. Um, and actually, you know, things are not great and they've made you a cup of tea and a biscuit because you're actually really upset. So maybe I'm going to have the best friend um, like way closer to you. Maybe I want them slightly out of shot so that you're either looking at them or the or the cup of tea um, and the biscuit. <laughs> Oh, I made myself laugh, uh, if nothing else. And um, maybe they're a lot closer to you. So you're getting that personal space, that you've got less personal space. They are much closer to you. You get the idea that this person is quite close to you. You get the, the feeling instantly that there is an intimacy there. Um, obviously, a lot of like the way that the actor performs like in that scene will dictate that as well. But even just moving someone closer to the camera, because remember, the camera is... Uh, you have to think about the camera as the person's head when they've got a headset on because that's exactly what's happening you literally could swap out the camera for someone's head and that would give you a good idea of like how that person's going to feel when they see when they kind of put the headset on and experience your piece so all of a sudden now the way that you play with space and especially if there's like multiple people in a scene um, or specific objects, you can really tell a lot about what you're trying to do based on how far or close uh, that object or person is to the camera. So instead of thinking about things as like wide shot or, um, you know, close up or whatever, because there's not there's not really much point in comparing because we are again, we are completely developing this new storytelling language. I would think about it in terms of almost like um, space kind of defines a lot of the cinematic language of VR. If that's not a soundbite, I don't know what is. I'll say it again. Space defines... Wait, I forgot what I said. Damn it! (laughs) Hang on. What did I say? It was really clever. I thought it sounded really clever. (laughs) Damn it! Um, what I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that now. Oh, and I try really hard not to listen back to these too much, because uh, otherwise it would put me off doing them, I think. Um, basically, instead of the equivalent of the close up and the wide shot and everything, using the space, like whether that be the actual physical location that you've got, like the feeling of being outside and being out and open and free is very different to being in a small room crowded with lots of things. That's a very claustrophobic feeling. And so much about VR storytelling and directing in VR is about feeling. It's about you want, it's, you know, one of the superpowers of VR is the fact that you can give someone a sense of atmosphere without even really doing anything. Like, uh, uh, often people will say that locations and space within VR become their own characters. And for a long time, I didn't really agree with that. But now, like having been in it for for, for years, um, I tend to agree. And I think the way that you want your user, your kind of audience member, the person experiencing it, the way that you want them to feel about a scene or a character or the action that's going on so much of that will be framed instantly by the location that you've chosen by the lighting of that location and obviously all of that stuff starts to get into kind of the weeds of like well you could use lighting design to direct attention and yeah that is very true but obviously again I'm trying to kind of boil it down to the key things that I would be thinking about especially if I was new to VR storytelling and directing so so let's recap so Choreography, I would say, is your number one friend. It's the easiest way to direct attention. It will have the biggest impact. And obviously, it's the least techie because you is you're just you could set up a camera and then physically move the props and the people in the scene to create the kind of um, the directing that you want uh, without having to do anything nice and techie. Um, editing. So getting through that story, thinking about how you want your user's attention to change throughout time like and again this will change if you're doing like for example like interactive pieces the way uh, if you've not seen the line which is a piece i think i've talked about in a previous episode it won um 
Venice Film Festival VR kind of selection, like I think last year or the year before. Um, and that is like a kind of like a beautiful like masterclass in interactive uh, VR storytelling because the interactions don't, it's not like a branch narrative. It's not like you can do different things and that will change um, the story. But the way you interact with the scene um, propels the story on and your movements in the scene and the actions that you have to take definitely change throughout the story and almost become their own story arc almost like there's a piece in the line where you know you've been trained that you are kind of like almost like helping this character as like a godlike figure um and I won't spoil it too much in case you haven't seen it but you know essentially it's set upon I'm not even sure what you would call it but it's a it's like a story that plays out on this like vintagey kind of uh tabletop it's kind of like a train imagine like a train set but it's like got all these like it's like got characters that um you know go along the same line every single day and it's like a big metaphor for life it's absolutely stunning for lots of different reasons um totally totally deserved like to win um but what I'm trying to say yeah so there's like the you as the audience are like this godlike figure that's kind of doing things like changing the direction of which way the character goes and stuff like that and it's all very like it's interactive but it's not it's it is still linear you're still pushing the narrative forward it's not like you're changing the narrative but there's definitely like moments in it where you like can't intervene but you want to or you you do intervene and it doesn't have like it like kind of backfires a little bit and it's like your your actions kind of in itself become a plot line and I found that fascinating that it worked on all these different levels that is like some really it was it's a really simple piece actually when you think about it it's beautifully designed but it's very simple but it's so masterful on so many different levels and that is because ultimately what the director of that piece has done is considered like the direction from the point of view of like what do I want my audience to feel like where do I want their attention to be and what do I want them to feel for these characters for themselves um and really hitting on those kind of like different um those different like emotionally impactful kind of like notes at the right time so much of that is to do with how they use the space and how they um, use choreography. And there's no editing in that piece because it's, it's, um, it's a piece where you kind of, you are editing almost because you're walking around different parts of the tabletop because it's a room scale experience. Um, the sound design, it is really beautiful, but there's nothing like, it's not like there's anything going to pop out behind you or anything. So it's not like they're using sound to massively draw your attention. It's just a beautiful, beautiful kind of example. I don't know why I've got gone off on a ramble about the line, but um, it's a beautiful example of using space and using kind of your audience's actions and the way that they interact with the scene as a way to kind of guide the story so I do think it's really important and as a director of VR you have to assume that at some point you you will you are relinquishing control because your audience can theoretically look anywhere but a good director in VR will kind of have faith and will will have done enough work on things like the choreography, the editing and the sound, um, mainly the first two, to kind of know that regardless of like where you want to look, you will most likely be looking the way that they want you to. That's like the, the, uh, the sign of a good director in VR. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say. Oh, I mean, I use this analogy quite a lot when I do talks on VR storytelling. So I would think about this. I think you should think about studying or at least giving some thought to magicians and the fact with the fact that magicians give you the illusion of free will but it's all kind of misdirection they want you to be looking at a specific hand because over in the other hand they're doing something sneaky that sets up for the next shot uh, and I think there's so much to be learned from that and 
could be applied to VR because it's the art of misdirection. The 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 fact that you you're basically saying you can look anywhere, can't you? You think you can look anywhere, but you're not going to because I've thought through every single thing in this scene and everywhere you're looking is by design. And that that is kind of the ultimate holy grail of directing in VR. So this one was a bit all over the shop. Sorry about that. Um, but hopefully that gives you a good overview of ways to think about directing a VR piece going forward. If you've got any follow-up, I would love to hear from you. I've had some of the most incredible messages over the last couple of days from you guys. And honest, honestly, it's like, this is why I want to do this. This is why I want to keep putting out this information. This is like one of the reasons why I'm like, so like psyched to be doing this challenge is because when I hear from you guys it just uh, it just makes my day and it makes my year and it makes this all worth it so please make me feel less of a crazy person for pacing up and down my living room talking to my phone for an hour each day um oh let's have a check in the step count 9800 boom nice I'll give you an idea of how long I've been doing that today um if you've got follow-up then please message me on uh, social media you can get me on Instagram and Twitter, Alex Makes VR. Uh, you can send a slightly longer question if you've got a question for future episodes to alexmakesvr at gmail.com. If you want to be reminded every single day when these episodes go live with a bit of a recap of what I'm talking about in the episode, then you can sign up at alexmakesvr.com to the newsletter. And I, I haven't been like saying this in other episodes, but I hear that it's um, actually quite important. Regardless of what platform you're uh, listening to me on, if you could please, please, please take a second to make sure that you are subscribed or following, um, depending on what platform you're on, um, that really, really helps apparently. And also will probably be another kind of a, a way of knowing when a new episode comes out. So that would mean the world to me if you would do that, if you're getting value from this podcast. Um, and if you if you can leave a review, if that's an option on the platform you're listening on, I think mainly Apple Podcasts, that would mean the world as well. Um, no pressure though, because I realise that that takes a bit of time and they've not made it the most easiest process in the world to do. But if you're getting value from this and you fancied saying um, a couple of nice things, I mean, or bad things, although ideally if you've got bad things to say, maybe maybe message me about them privately first before you start publicly bashing me. But... Uh... <laughs> If you do have anything nice um, to say, then maybe pop it in a review. But again, no pressure. Uh, that's it from me today. I hope you've had a wonderful weekend or actually you might be listening to this um, Sunday morning when it comes out. And if you are, enjoy your Sunday. I hope you have a delightful day. If you're listening to this any time in the future, I hope you're having a wonderful day too. I hope that the world is slowly reassembling itself from the chaos that it has been for the last few months. Um, and until tomorrow, that's all I have to say. Speak to you tomorrow. <laughs>